Caroline Brock interviews Jesus on the subject of Mormon religion. The interview took place in Philadelphia, USA on the 21st of July, 2012. This is session two. Okay, great. <coughs> Start with some... Um... Well, hey, what, what we'll do this today is just we terminated the... Uh-huh. Interview yesterday a bit early because I had to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and so today is the continuation of the discussion about the Mormon religion with Caroline Brock. Okay, so... Fire away, Caroline. <laughs> wait, are we already starting? We are. <laughs> All right, so today we're continuing our conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, the temple. Mm-hmm. And um, just to give some of the viewers a background about um, where I stand on the temple, um, I personally, um, although sometimes I've had problems with the temple, um, I've also had wonderful experiences in the temple. And they, some of my most sacred experiences I've had in the temple, and those experiences have propelled me forward in my search for truth. So um, I just want to reiterate the fact that I deeply respect the people that work in the temple and their commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, I have my uncle right now is serving as one of the temple presidents for Mm -hmm. one of the top five temples. So I, um, I see the work that, that people that work in the temple do and I see how it changes them. Um, My father-in-law is a sealer and I see how it's changed them and and changed them for the better and it's made them more loving. So I have um, a great respect for those things, and at the same time, Mm -hmm. it would be great to um, to talk about some of the things in the temple that go on, so that that, uh, Mormons could have a greater understanding to how the temple was started and what perhaps were the original aims and what maybe it's evolved into. Yeah, and you have some personal worries too about like talking about these kind of things. Um, So if you can just relax about that, that'd be good and. And yeah. we can then proceed, uh, and we, we don't need to get into a lot of detail because because the, again, there are some very basic things that we need to yes. acknowledge that are happening in the temple, um, that are to do with the history of the church itself. So, uh-huh. mm. great, and yeah. I, yeah, I'm not planning on doing any any detailed things. Mm-hmm. Um, to begin, I just want to um, to quote a scripture that that I know Mormons see as fundamental in the founding of our church. Yes. Um, it, it comes from Malachi 4, 5 through 6, yeah. and then was reiterated in D&C 2 mm-hmm. and in Joseph Smith History 1, chapter 1, verse 38, which talks about, um, it says here, Behold, I, re- I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. And if it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Mm-hmm. So something that we take, what we have, um, the conclusion that we've made from this prophecy is that through temple work and through binding families together, through a ceiling, which we're going to talk about in a second, that we are, in fact, preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um can you give me any insight to that? <laughs> well, obviously, I'm already here. Yes. So, um, so it's not a great and dreadful day. Um, in fact, uh, any time I feel more love is present on the earth, it's a, it's a great and lovely day mm-hmm. rather than a dreadful one. So, so the reality is that a lot of these Bible prophecies that are referred to while they have some truth in them, they also have some error in them. So the reason why Malachi called it the great and dreadful day of the Lord is that because there is this un- underlying concept that exists in both the Jewish faith and Christian faith that, that when God comes to the earth, or you know, and, and there's this implication that I am God in that process, which is obviously not true, but there is this implication that when God comes to the earth, that he will waste the wicked, um, destroy the wicked, and the righteous will then survive. And this is a very gross misrepresentation of the way God deals with all of her children. So 
so for a start, the scripture itself is founded on a principle that demonstrates God to be an unloving God rather than a loving one. And so any scripture in the Bible or any other book that portrays God as an unloving God is automatically questionable mm -hmm. because of my experience of God is always that God has been loving. God also doesn't uh, destroy things ever. And when I say that, what I mean is that God doesn't come along and destroy any of her creations that she has created. She, God is a very loving and also wise being and therefore creates everything perfect. So even what's happening on the earth today, there is a degree of perfection in it, um, in that men and women on earth are being corrected through their actions. So, so in other words, men and women are acting out of harmony with love and truth. They then see the result of those actions and then they become satisfied, dissatisfied with their um, actions and that causes them to, to look at changing and, and to demonstrate a true desire to change. So, so again, that verse is flawed in the sense that, uh, of looking at how change will come upon the mm -hmm. earth. God does not force change upon any one of her cre creations. She encourages change by giving creation more of her love and then the creation automatically responds to this love. Now, all of the creation aside from the human soul responds automatically. Mm -hmm. so, so they all respond as they feel more and more of God's love uh, hitting the planet. They uh, automatically respond in more harmony with that love. Of course, humankind have a free will, and so they can choose to act out of harmony with the love. And many do, of course. But as they act out of harmony with love, the, the discrepancy between the, what love would do and what they are doing is so great that eventually their own soul will hurt as a result and this causes them to pause and to to make adjustments and change and that's how god encourages change so so every prophecy that focuses on a gloom and doom situation for the earth is really out of harmony with god on a number of levels and this is something that we must understand the second part of that prophecy talks about a priesthood now the concept of a priesthood was, began very early in the Jewish faith. Um, and in fact, it was present in many other faiths way before the Jewish faith even came into existence, which is the reason why the Jewish faith also absorbed some of those particular teachings. The reason why, and the concept of was, the underlying concept was that a priesthood was necessary in order to bring the people who were not connected to God to a condition mm -hmm. of being connected to God. Mm -hmm. And while that might sound uh, important to the whole process, the reality is God wants the individual connection. So from God's perspective, God never sets up something that is counter to her own desires as to what she would like to see. So what she would like to see is each individual connecting to her directly. So God is not interested in setting up a priesthood laity Mm -hmm. where the priesthood becomes responsible for the people's connection to God. God is only interested in having the people individually connect to God as they desire, and that's her, that's her own uh, desire to have that occur. So from God's perspective, so from a father's perspective, he's looking at this from a, all of these prophecies, he, he sees them, of course, and he sees who gave them. And most of the time, as we said yesterday, the people who gave them were spirits who obviously had certain patriarchal or matriarchal feelings towards others and therefore felt a degree of responsibility. They then set themselves up as a, a go-between, if you like, between or mediators between God and man. And as a result of that, they... Uh, then perpetrated these beliefs. The problem with the beliefs being perpetrated, though, is that it does cause certain people to have power over other people. So this whole concept of a priesthood is very damaging to the furtherance of truth on the planet. And what we need to do is to start seeing that the priesthood is an unnecessary part of a person's personal development towards God, with one exception, and that is that if, if any member of the priesthood taught the people the truth, then of course the people would then realise they could have a personal relationship with God and they don't need the priest 
with the exception of needing him just to tell them more of the truth. Mm. So if a, if a priest knows the truth, then it would be wise for him to tell the people the truth, and then th that obviously would have a large benefit on the people. Mm -hmm. but, but it doesn't make him better in God's eyes than the average person. And, it, and God doesn't actually give him responsibility, nor does God give him um, glory or honour for or that authority. Responsi or authority for that responsibility. All of the authority that God ever accords to any individual is always based on the love that exists in the individual and the love they reflect. So in other words, the people who have the highest authority from God's perspective are the people who are the most loving, which is very, very different to what we see occurring mm -hmm. here on earth. So all of that being said, when you look at a prophecy like here in the book of Malachi and, of course, many other holy books have similar types of prophecies establishing a priesthood and establishing a priesthood to get people ready for the day of reckoning. Mm -hmm. there, so there's a problem with the day of reckoning in the sense that the day of reckoning happens for every person um, every single day, in fact. Um, so every single day, whatever we engage to do, there is an immediate uh, penalty upon our soul if that is out of harmony with love. There's an immediate benefit to our soul if it's in harmony with love. And so there is no specific day of judgment. There are, of course, many people feel there is judgment when they pass uh -huh. because they didn't know that there was this constant thing going in their day-to-day -day life where they chose unloving things and it was negative to their soul and they chose po loving things and it was positive to their soul. And so what they do when they pass, they, they usually see themselves in the mirror and see themselves as a direct reflection of what they've created mm -hmm. and then they feel like they're being judged. But the reality is the judgment has occurred every single moment. Mm -hmm. Every single moment we choose to do something. So bearing that in mind, there is also no collective day of judgment in the sense that, you know, everyone on the planet gets judged at the same day. And there is no concept uh, from God's perspective of Armageddon or some future, you know, damaging event that's going to occur where the wicked will be destroyed and the righteous will be saved. None of these concepts are actually in harmony with love, nor are they in harmony with God's intentions. God designed free will as a gift and God honours the free will. So God doesn't force us to change. God's desiring our change and encouraging our change, just like a parent would with their child. And, and an unloving parent would force change. So they'd belt the child or, mm -hmm. or, or do punishing things to the child to force change. And God's not an unloving parent. He's, he's better than the most loving parent on this planet. And therefore God never forces change. So if you bear all of that in mind with a verse like that, you can see how the problem with establishing a temple or some kind of priesthood is that it's all based already on some very false beliefs about God. And, and as a result of that, anything that then subsequently results in terms of the laws or principles that are established for that particular priesthood naturally are going to have particular problems with them because they're already out of harmony with the very core precepts about God and love, which are the only things that really need to govern our actions. So when we examine these prophecies, we, we can discard many of them immediately as the statements of a man or men or women who are either linked to spirits who are also men or women but are not connected to, who are not connected fully to God. Because if they were connected fully to God, they would never wish to establish a priesthood for the sake of saving mankind from a future doom. Great. So if we then look at the Mormon religion, uh, using that as the basis to establish some kind of arrangement inside of the temple, then you can see that the, the arrangements inside of the temple are basically man-driven or, or mankind, humankind-driven. In other words... They are not established by God directly because God does not wish for man to have these kind of arrangements. Now, the reason why they are established is the interesting part, I feel. And the main reason why they are established is because we love ritual. We love, and the reason why we love ritual is it does to a degree help us connect to a process where we feel more connected to God. And this is why many religions in the past and presently establish ritual. Now, God himself is not interested in ritual. God's interested in a sincere heart connecting to God. And I said this in the first century, and you can read it many times in the Bible, where God is 
looking for hearts that are responsive. That's the real religion, if you like, the, the pure heart of mm -hmm. the individual who desires God, desires love, desires to love their fellow man. That is the real religion. And it's not, if you think about it, it's not really a religion. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the first century he called it the way, because it's not a religious teaching, but rather the, the most effective way that mankind can all live our lives and live our lives in harmony with joy and peace and love. Now, if you look at that as the way, then anything else that embellishes this into some form of ritual is actually doing so because of certain emotions that exist within the people. Now, some of the people have emotions where they want to be honoured as the leader of a group of people. And those particular people obviously have certain emotions attached to that. Then there's other people who love to be led because they don't wish to make personal decisions or have personal responsibility for their life in many cases, so they love to be led. And when these people who love to be led are always looking, they are always looking for a leader. And once the leader establishes themselves as a leader, and often this is a spirit-induced issue, and then the two groups come together and you've got now what you would call a clergy laity type class, where there is a separate priesthood, and then there's the laity who the priesthood are meant to serve. Now, now if they really did serve, that would be fantastic. Uh, but if they served in two particular areas, in other words, they served the actual truth that God has about the universe and, and life and, and love and truth in particular, then that would be great. But unfortunately, many times they ser create service through ritual, and none of these rituals are actually helpful in establishing a relationship with God. One of the other reasons why ritual is established in most religions is because we become very frustrated with our personal relationship with God. And in this frustration, we finish up creating ritual so that we can feel like we're actually getting somewhere in our relationship mm -hmm. with God. Rather than actually um, feeling like, oh, very disappointed with our own mm -hmm. relationship with God and, and having those kind of feelings, what we have a tendency to do is to, is to, instead of that, engage a process that tells us that we're actually worshipping God. Mm -hmm. right? and, uh, and the process tells us, that, and even so, inside of ourselves, we don't necessarily feel the connection with God. Now, when we establish a process based on ritual, then lots of spirits become involved with the process. Mm -hmm. And this is why we will have many spiritual experiences mm -hmm. through engaging ritual. And this is what happens in almost all religions on the planet, not just the Mormon religion. So in almost all religions on the planet, there are rituals involved. The spirits engage this ritual with the person on earth. The spirit gives a spiritual experience to the person on earth. The person thinks that that is a connection with God that's mm -hmm. just been established. So they engage more in the ritual. Mm -hmm. And so the rituals now become established as a way of worshipping God because there's a feeling in the person that God wants that yes. and that God rewards that. Mm -hmm. When the reality is it's not God rewarding it, it's actually yeah. spirits who have an investment, an impersonal emotional investment in maintaining the ritual themselves. And this is where I feel we need to be very careful when we establish rituals. So it's very good to look at, in any religion, it's very good to look at all of the rituals and ask yourself, does God really feel this ritual is necessary? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what are my personal emotional investments in maintaining this ritual? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is if, if it's not necessary for my connection with God, then I must have a personal emotional reason for establishing as a necessary part of my worship. Mm -hmm. And that's the, I feel... All of these verses that you can quote regarding the priesthood, regarding the temple arrangements, when you look at the actual temple arrangements in any church, so in any church-based arrangements in any priesthood, uh -huh. they all of these principles apply to all of those religions, not mm -hmm. just to the Mormon religion. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest we do with, like, say, the book of Isaiah or the book of Revelation? So we've got a lot of people who spend a lot of time analyzing those and... Yes, uh, we become, um, many of these books got established because there is a deep fear in humanity that if they do not connect to God, that somehow they'll be punished for the lack of connection. And therefore, they've constructed these ideas that there is a day of reckoning, um, mm -hmm. a, a, an actual physical day of reckoning that will occur on the planet. Mm -hmm. 
and and therefore they become very afraid of the physical potential of the day of reckoning. As a result of that, there is this uh, feeling that that develops within them that they become obsessed with what are, what is called prophecy. Now, the reality is that many many of these prophecies have never come true and will never come true. Um, and this sort of, in a way, establishes these prophecies of being false. Now, however, almost every book that has been written by a prophet has information in it about love. And this is what we need to focus on. So when I read the book of Jeremiah or the book of Isaiah or the book of Ezekiel or the book of Revelation, I'm focused on what can this tell me about love. And this is, was my focus also in the first century. The book of Isaiah and Jeremiah were very important to me because there were certain verses in those books that refer to the heart of man being like a heart of a stone. Mm -hmm. And God wants us to soften our heart so that our heart can become a heart of flesh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a heart that feels. And when I read those verses, I go, hmm, this is telling me mankind generally is very shut down to their own emotions. They're very shut down to love. They're very shut down to the way they love. If you look at many of the prophecies in these books, they all refer to how mankind has treated other person, persons on the planet. And I then look at that and I go, yes, this is a great illustration of at some point we have to change the way in which we interact with each other. We have to become more loving with each other. Mm -hmm. And this is these prophecies, which are um, very good prophecies, many of them, all talk about ushering in this time of peace. And I go, okay, how is this time of peace going to occur? And, you know, I've been referred to as the Prince of Peace, but how, in the end, is that going to even occur? This was my questioning in the first century. And the way it's going to occur is for firstly one person, mm -hmm. and then eventually many people, and then eventually every person who lives on this planet engaging a process of softening their heart to love and becoming more loving in their interactions with everyone around them. And the way they do that is they can connect to God because God can help our heart soften. Mm -hmm. And all of these pro prophetic books refer to these particular events. Mm -hmm. So when I see in the book of Revelation that God is making all things new, I go, okay, this is not by the force that the book claims. Because I know God to be not a forceful God, but rather a God that engages our free will. But it is a very good truth, because God does desire to make all things new. He wants to bring the kingdom that we, we see established and, and was established in the first century in the heavens, in the celestial spheres. He wants to bring this kingdom to earth. But the only way this kingdom is going to come to earth is by mankind, humankind, engaging the process on earth of becoming more loving. And so I see the underlying message of even these prophetic books as being a message of love rather than a message of pain and doom. Mm -hmm. However, unfortunately, the emotional condition of the writers interfered with much of this prophecy, the prophecy about love. Uh -huh. And as a result of that, they have this good and bad mentality where if you're good, you'll be rewarded. If you're bad, you'll be punished. And while there are certain truths regarding what we sow, we reap, it's not because we're being punished. It's because we're just reaping the results of acting out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. God has established a completely loving universe. Every time we act out of harmony, that we will reap the results of the laws trying mm -hmm. to correct us into becoming more loving. And every single prophetic book that has ever been written, and not they don't not only in the Bible, but they're in the Book of Mormon and many other books as well in 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 the Koran and other books. Every one of them has this dualistic thing where you can have a look at it, and some of it uh, pertains to love. So my suggestion to any religious person is take all the stuff that pertains to love and apply it to your heart. Mm -hmm. A lot of it pertains to punishment and fear. Take all the stuff that is pertaining to punishment and fear and discard it. And then ask yourself, why am I so attracted to punishment and fear? And if we look at, as a humanity, why we are so attracted to punishment and fear we'll see this is very much about what we've been taught by our parents that love is. And usually most people have been taught that love involves a smack here and there. 
like a, 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 a physical violence perpetrated against you. And then they project, project that particular belief on God. And God is better than the most loving person on the planet, not worse or, or the mm-hmm. same as the average person on the planet. And we need to start applying that across all religions. Thank you. That's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we do in the temple is um, we are sealed together as families. And so we believe that, that everyone needs to be sealed somehow on the physical, mm-hmm. in the physical realm. So what we do is something called proxy work. Mm-hmm. And just to explain that for people who don't know what that means is mm-hmm. that, is that although, um, like, let's say in my, in, in a normal Mormon's, um, lifetime, they go through the temple and do ordinances only once, but then they go through many other times and spend countless hours doing those same things for other people. So they'll get a name that'll say someone's name who lived in the 1400s and they go through for that person. And they, they look at this as a sacred service that they're doing because they feel as though somehow these ordinances or these ceilings need to occur on earth. And until those are, those occur, these spirits in the spirit world are held back from progressing. Mm -hmm. My question is, do families need to be sealed on earth in order for them to remain together in heaven? Well, firstly, again, we need to look at the underlying motiva- motivation. But before we do that, I must comment that what I, one thing I love about the Mormon religion is that they do have a belief system about the spirit world. Mm-hmm. And this is very, very good. because it, it, The issue they face, though, is that many of the beliefs about the spirit world are not entirely accurate. And uh, many other religions don't have any real mm-hmm. f- firm belief about the spirit world at all which makes even discussing some of the issues about the spirit world even more difficult. Uh-huh. But when we look at uh, this, this question about the sealing of families, you can see that underlying, the underlying motivation for the sealing of families is to bind people in an everlasting manner. Mm-hmm. Now, this has a lot of power for a particular religious faith. Because if you finish up binding a family here on earth and those, that family believes mm-hmm. they are now bound for eternity, then of course it's going to make that family or members of that family, individual members of the family, it's going to make it very difficult for these individual members to actually confront any unloving or untruthful behaviour within the family. Mm-hmm. It's actually going to cause conformity mm-hmm. within the family. And not just conformity in the family while they're on earth, but the potential, because of this feeling of making a promise to God Uh about the binding, um, there's now this conformity to the family for the rest of your life, the rest of your existence. And this is a very dangerous thing to do, to conform to any person on earth, um, particularly when there's the potential of that person not fully understanding the truth. Mm-hmm. Because, because if the person doesn't understand the truth, then you can, can see some kind of further truth. If you're bound to the family, you're going to have a very strong feelings of guilt and other feelings and pressure, feel mm-hmm. emotional pressure and psychological pressure to not tell the truth mm-hmm. and to not change. And, uh, and this is a very powerful means of controlling change within an organisation, of actually reducing its potential to become more loving. The more loving thing to do would be to allow change for everyone because the faster you change, the more I can learn from you through Mm -hmm. that change and therefore the faster potentially I can change. And if I limit your potential to change, then I am really in the long run just limiting humanity's potential of discovering more truth. So this is a very dangerous act to take, and it's something that God doesn't agree with, of course, but God allows because this is one of our problems. We have an emotional addiction to the concept of family. Mm-hmm. When I say that, I, I used to say in the first century quite, quite frequently many things about the family, and there are quotes in the Bible that refer to some of the things that I've actually said or modifications of what mm-hmm. I've actually said about the family. The family can be a great impediment to your relationship with God and your relationship with yourself and your relationship with your potential partner. And the, the reason why it can be a great impediment because if they do not agree and you feel bound to them psychologically and emotionally, then it's going to be very, very difficult for you to confront the belief system of the family. 
However, there's one thing that I'd like to mention about the Mormon religion that is quite true, and that is the Mormon religion has this underlying concept about soulmates, although it's stated differently. And I don't know if it's a further question you were going to ask, or it is. It, it, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can answer, ask that um, as we go. But this is something that is a, the underlying truth that we can discuss, um, that w where there are potentially two people that are bound by God. Mm -hmm. and this, but it's not a person of our selection. Mm -hmm. And this is the underlying problem too. If we continue to think it's a person of our selection, then uh, we are not going to understand the concept. But if you look at the binding of families, so what I'm basically saying with the binding of families is that there is a strong spirit influence upon the religion's faith. And this is, again, across all religions, to bind people to the same religion. And, and this prevents the absorption of more truth. In addition, there is this strong feeling of wanting to punish a person who is no longer or breaks uh -huh. the binding. And, and, you know, in many religions, this is called disfellowshipping or, or disassociation or excommunication. And the process of excommunication is a punishment, a form of punishment, to, to sh for the rest of that spiritual community to tell that person, you've done the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no need for such things at all. Every single person has a personal relationship with God. There is no need for such rules to be applied to any religion. There is, and from God's perspective, it can prevent positive change. Of course, it can also prevent negative change, which is one reason why religions embrace it. So one reason why religions embrace a binding together of families or a binding together of the religious group itself is because it helps the group stay moral. And while morality is a very important question that we need to resolve if we ever want to become close to God or actually live in harmony with ethics mm -hmm. in, in our day-to-day -day life, it's not something that can be forced upon another. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that comes from their heart. And so any religion that is talking about something that comes from the heart is going to be, in the end, a very, um, a very permissive religion. Mm -hmm. In other words, it will permit as what God permits. Now, what does God permit on this planet? Well, God permits murders. God permits rapes. God permits... But God also permits many beautiful things happening. Now, why does God permit all of these things? Because God honours the free will of the individual... And God wants the individual to change from their heart, not to have for change forced upon them. Now, historically, if you look at all the religions that have forced change on another group of people, they have resorted in the end to wars, mm -hmm. to mass murders, to mass exterminations, just in justification of this underlying belief that they can do so because they have God's approval. And this is something that these spirits, when they, uh, when these people, when they pass into the spirit world, they realise very rapidly that such actions are totally out of harmony mm -hmm. with love. And they are so removed from God that they finish up being in the hells, even though they believed they should arrive in the heavens, in the heavens. of the spirit world. And, and this is the problem with such underlying bindings, is that eventually it can result in things being forced upon another person, change being controlled and forced in a group of people, either a family or, or a larger group. And these kind of forcings are never in harmony with love and are completely out of harmony with God's principles about love. And this is what we must understand. Okay. Yeah. So um, if the spirits that founded Mormonism, so you're saying that they had this desire to bind people, even people that had passed <clears throat> through proxy work, to bind people or attract spirits to the earth? Yes, um, there's a number of different uh, uh, desires in them. Um, we need to see them more completely, perhaps. Okay. Um, firstly, there was this strong belief that if you create a strong family, then you have a strong religion, and if all of that family you know, supports the religion. So there has to be a way of enforcing the family to support the religion. So, so then you construct belief systems around that, of course. Secondly, there was a strong belief uh, in, you know, by Joseph Smith himself that it was okay for a man to have many wives. And, and this was a great way to, to have larger families. 
Now, if you have large families where you have a, a patriarch and, and many children, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, tens or even sometimes Lots. approaching over hundreds 50, of children yeah. over, over a person's life, then, of course, if all of those children are bound to the family, you can grow a religion very rapidly on the earth if they all remain a part of the religion. Mm -hmm. So this is an underlying feeling that the spirits had as well. One way that we can grow this religion is just allow for the, the people who are in the religion to have many, 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 many children mm -hmm. and, uh, and many wives, many children, and this is a great way of um, perpetrating the the growth of the of the organization very rapidly and yeah. this is one reason why in america in particular um the mormon religion growed very rapidly for, for for that kind of reason thirdly one way to make any form of religion grow rapidly is to feed the addiction of the individual who is involved in the religion so if the individual involved in the religion is involved in sexual exploits or or something like that or they have a very permissive attitude towards women or they don't have an equality feeling towards women, then all you do is you tell them that uh, they can have many wives and, uh, um, and now the, the, the person feels very attracted to that belief system, which is what these spirits did with Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith already had an attraction to that belief system through his sexual injuries, and then the spirits allow, you know, manipulated okay. this particular injury so, and, and gave a teaching to him that then perpetrated the religion on a number of levels and also his own injury, which meant mm -hmm. that the, this, you know, the, the underlying belief would be perpetrated quite rapidly. And this is a very powerful way that spirits use to manipulate the growth of religions on the planet, mm -hmm. just feed the addiction of the individual and uh, give them spiritual experience along with the addiction. And now you, you're theirs for a long mm -hmm. time, and in Joseph Smith's case, theirs for the entire time you're on earth. And many people on earth, and this happens in all of the forms of religion, as well as all of the New Age uh, religions that are currently on the planet. There's just spirit feeding the addiction, then you know feeding a teaching based on the addiction, and then perpetrating a belief system, often which is unloving or unjust or unethical or in, in, uh, not equal. And, and then what they do is they perpetrate this belief system over and over again because all of the people who are attracted to it are all having a similar emotional injury and mm -hmm. therefore they all finish up you know, perpetrating the system. And the growth of the religion is very rapid for a period of time, of uh -huh. course. Um, obviously, over a longer period of time, anything that's out of harmony with love and truth will eventually get exposed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with the situation of polygamy uh -huh. within the organisation in early days... And eventually this particular thing starts to get exposed. And, and therefore there's more of an outcry by society towards mm -hmm. the particular religion, asking the religion to conform. And, uh, and sooner or later the religion is confronted with this particular unloving act that it's engaged. Now this also applies to every religion sooner or later. So for example you see the Muslim religion um, still ex sort of executing uh, women who mm -hmm. have been uh, immoral the, interestingly enough, you very rarely see the man they've been immoral with being executed, yes. uh, which is a, which is a problem in its in its own self. And the world is in an outcry, naturally so, mm -hmm. because because it's unethical and unloving, and it's unjust because the man isn't being treated the same way as the woman. Mm -hmm. And so the world's in an outcry, and this is reflecting back to that religion that that particular teaching of the religion is out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And you could choose any religion on the planet, and you will always mm -hmm. have this particular thing occurring. Because the general population it often can see the disharmony with love outside. better uh -huh. than the religion Definitely. itself can. Mm. So, so my feelings on this particular issue is, is one of we need to actually, again, look at what is loving and what, what, what God is asking us to do is to become more loving and to be willing to change our hearts to become more loving, not to force anything on another individual to cause them to change, but rather encourage them to change through our love that we reflect. Mm -hmm. And that's how everything around me changed in the first century. That's how things around me are changing now, just by my complete reflection of what is love and how love needs to be engaged on the planet. Because that is the underlying truth. The underlying truth that is that we need to address love in all of these different areas. Now, just to clarify, because this was going to be one of my uh, questions further on down the road. Mm -hmm. 
um, polygamy was stopped um, yes. from the manifesto and from the United States government saying that they wouldn't um, they wouldn't recognize Utah as a state. But there are still people because of uh, one the of the teachings. revelations. Yes, mm -hmm. there's still people um, that believe that in order to enter the highest highest kingdom in the celestial kingdom, that that's where you practice polygamy. And in fact, God probably has multiple wives. So can you explain that? <laughs> well, again, I feel that, that is an emotional injury being perpetrated upon the planet in a lot of different religious forms. You see the same kind of thing going on in New Age uh, teachings. You see the same kind of teaching in tantric sexual teachings, where there is this underlying belief that having multiple relationships with a person is the highest form of love. I cannot agree, because what I've observed in my own development is that God has created two halves to one soul, and the only person God intended you to share your sexual relationship with is one other person, the other half of your own soul. And uh, for this reason, all of the teachings associated with permissive sexual activity or polygamy or other type, which I feel are all per permissive sexual activities, they are all out of harmony with love, because they're all out of harmony with what God originally created. So God originally created two, the soul, which splits into two halves, and eventually God's intention is that all of us find our other half and enter into this everlasting relationship with that other half that's both sexual in nature but also a lot to do with desires and passions in all sorts of directions. It's very creative. Myself and Mary have engaged in that relationship for 2,000 years. We've seen only the people who are willing to engage like that reach the celestial heavens. And I made many references to this in the, you know, that have been quoted or misquoted in the Bible of the, in my first century life, where I indicated to people that the person they married on earth was not necessarily the person that they were going to be with forever, because at the end of the day, God created one person for them. Now, a lot of the teachings of polygamy and even the acceptance in the heart of men and women that multiple relationships are acceptable all come from sexual emotional injuries that are within society generally. And these emotional injuries get imposed upon religions. Now, it's interesting how they get imposed. On, upon some religions, they do not allow you to... You only get married to one person and they never allow a divorce. So this is like a very negative imposition on the religion in the sense that you can't grow, you can't change, you can't move from one partner to another partner if you work out that the partner you're with is not your soulmate or not your, mm. your, the partner that God intended you to be with. And when I say God intended, God created you to be together with your soulmate. Uh -huh. So, so you know, sooner or later you're going to discover who that is, that person, if you exercise that open desire. So God's intention was that we eventually get with our soulmate. Any religion that says prevents you from, from finding that person is out of harmony with love. And any religion that says that, no, there's more than one person that you can engage sexually with and otherwise with uh, in, an, in a relationship um, is also out of harmony with love uh, because they're both out of harmony with God's original intention. Now, for the average person, there is a feeling in their heart that they know they're looking for that special person. And this is uh, something God created inside of the soul of each individual, this desire to find the special person. Unfortunately, man has become so uh, what I would call jaded and um, discouraged about the process of finding the special person that they've come up with belief systems that say there is no special person. If you ask the average child, the average child believes that there is a special person. But by the time a child becomes a teenager, by this time the parents and the society has usually taught them that there is no special person. And so they then engage many times with many different relationships over the course of their life. And in some cases, like in, in some religions, they even permit the multiple of wives and so forth, which is actually permitting inequality mm -hmm. between the genders. And there, you have to ask yourself, if there is inequality between the genders on either side, masculine or the feminine side, then how is that in harmony with God's original intention and creation? And also, it's completely out of harmony with what we personally, generally desire when we're, when we're very small and in a quite a pure condition. In addition, God does not have many partners sexually. 
God uh, is, is a complete soul that has a sexual relationship with masculine and feminine qualities that has a sexual relationship with itself. And that sexual relationship is all about creation. And eventually that's how God wishes us to be. The two halves that we perceive as halves at this point in time eventually get to the, together and merge so they no longer even perceive themselves mm-hmm. to be two halves. And that's eventually what we will be. One soul expressed in two physical forms, masculine and feminine, or it could even be masculine and masculine in the sense of two physical forms. It doesn't really matter whether it's a two males, two females, or a male and a female, as long as it's the soulmate that you're actually focusing on. And you will eventually live with that being, that person, for the rest of your existence. And you'll become so close together as you won't even have two minds anymore. Mm -hmm. And you won't even have two hearts anymore. You'll eventually have one heart and one mind. And that's what God originally created. And, and also, that is what God is. A being, a very powerful being who created our universe and, and, and begat us as children. But that being who, who is actually now a complete unified being mm-hmm. within itself. Does not need anyone else to exist. Does not need anyone else to experience joy. Does not need anyone else to have sexual relationship with and so forth. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. And if we if we understand that um, is the underlying principle, then we will start seeing that many of the teachings on the planet uh, that are right the way through society, not just in religion, some of which are quite negative, you know, in terms of controlling, some of which are the opposite, like so permissive that they mm-hmm. are, they are immoral, and either one is out of harmony with the truth of what God created. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the laws that we that that yeah. we um, yep, that we covenant to in the temple, and I just want to remind people that are watching that I'm not going to reveal anything that I promise not to reveal, yeah. and that we actually should be talking more about some of the laws more openly yes. because um, because they're they're open for discussion. Yeah. Um, but just as an aside, um, I have a question about um, of this. Are there sacred things that God teaches that he doesn't want other people who aren't as progressed to know? (laughs) Um, No, but uh, let me clarify. When we are not very developed in love, there are certain things about God's universe that we cannot understand. Mm -hmm. And when our soul is not engaged and only our mind is engaged, there are certain things in the universe that we just will never understand while we're in that condition. To actually understand more, we have to grow. Mm-hmm. So, so there'll, it'll be like a, our, our whole life is going to be like it's already been to a degree on this earth in that we arrived on the earth the first five years, we learnt a lot of basic skills, we finished up in school where they taught us other more advanced skills and eventually we might have ended up in a university where we had some even more advanced skills and knowledge being given to us because we were ready for that knowledge because uh-huh. of what we'd done previously. Mm-hmm. So the reality is that God does not wish to restrict any truth at all from any person that is God's child. And so all of us are God's children. God is not wishing to restrict any truth from entering us. However, there is this mechanism by which truth enters us. And the mechanism is how loving we become. So the more loving we become in our soul, the, the real heart of ourselves, the more we'll understand So God is not restricting the knowledge. If you think about it, what's happening is we are restricting Mm -hmm. ourselves by not becoming more loving. And therefore, we're not able to fully understand the other truths. And this is what we need to come to understand. God does not restrict knowledge to any individual. However, a lack of love prevents us from understanding the higher things of God. That is the only restriction that is ever placed upon any individual who has ever been on this planet. If you bear that in mind, then obviously there are certain things you cannot present to people who are not yet loving enough to receive them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, um, and I said that in the first century, I have other things to teach you which you are not yet ready for. Now, I wasn't stating that from the perspective of uh, I'm the, you know, the mediator between you and God and therefore I have a bigger role yeah. than you or any of those kind of perspectives. I was just acknowledging 
the condition of love of the individuals who were listening to me and telling them that they weren't yet ready to mm-hmm. find another thing about love or truth when they were not yet mm-hmm. practicing love in a different, you know, in the way that they'd already been taught. And so um, if you focus everything from that perspective, you'll find it's very simple. All it means is that I need to grow in love, and that obviously with God I can receive God's love and therefore grow in love. And as I receive God's love, I understand automatically more of the universe around me and how it works. And we, and I understand my mm-hmm. body, I understand my spirit body, I understand relationships, I understand everything more. But when I restrict giving that knowledge to another person, so in other words, when I make the choice to stop you from receiving the knowledge that I already have, I am automatically being unloving. It, can, it should only be you that restricts Restricts. that knowledge. So in other words, you saying to me, I don't want to know, is a restriction of the knowledge, and so therefore I wouldn't tell you. Um, Or you having a feeling, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. Or you going into fear about what I'm talking about. Or you getting angry with me because Mm -hmm. of what I'm talking about. Well, that's all indications you don't want to know. And and so under those circumstances, I won't say. You know, it's quite as simple as that. However, I would not make a decision for you to not to okay. that I that I know something that mm-hmm. I wish to impart to you. Of course, if I'm truly loving, I'd wish to impart everything I've ever learnt yes. to another person, and and I would never restrict you from from gaining that knowledge. I understand though that you may restrict yourself from gaining that knowledge. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I feel that any religion that restricts a group of people from gaining certain knowledge is already out of harmony with that underlying principle of love. Any religion that restricts another group of people is making a choice for that other group of people. And that in itself is something God does not do. God does not make your choices Mm -hmm. for you. And therefore, if I'm in harmony with God, I will never make your choices for you. Okay, Mm -hmm. great. All right. Um, okay, so th- it, within the temple, there's different things that go on, but one of the main things that goes on is called the endowment ceremony, mm-hmm. which an endowment is a gift. So mm-hmm. it's something that we feel as we participate in it, we somehow receive an endowment um, from God specifically. And um, in essence, at its very core, this endowment ceremony is a process of covenanting um, to keep a series of six laws mm-hmm. so we're going to be talking just briefly about those laws and and your opinion or you, you, your, the way that you see them based upon the laws of God mm-hmm. uh, the first covenant the first law that we covenant to keep is called the law of the Lord mm-hmm. and it's hard to talk about this law because for many reasons um, it's states that a woman is to be obedient to a man when a man is obedient to the Lord. Right. And I feel like a lot of spirits have a lot of pain. Um, yes. A lot it, of, in particular, a lot of women's spirits have yes. a lot of pain. And, and until the 60s, um, until there was an outcry amongst the women, um, the law actually said that the woman has to be obedient to the man full stop, mm-hmm. no matter what basically he said Mm -hmm. and so um and then they modified it as long as (laughs) and they modified it as the society started to say yes you know as the outcry came and so we do have a belief that god the mother and god the father are somehow one but Mm -hmm. that to have a proper order in which this develops the man with the the proper order of things is that the man is kind of presiding over the woman Mm -hmm. so can you um, well, again, it's like totally that. untrue. Um, there is no um, provision that God has made for men or women to dominate the other gender. The problem that we have on the planet is that uh, mankind and, and womankind have, have at times historically attempted to dominate the other gender. At the moment on the planet, a lot of women are trying to dominate their men in their relationships, for example. Historically, men have dominated women in their mm-hmm. relationships and treated women very badly. And of course, there is a lot of hurt of people when they arrive in the spirit world. And there's a lot of hurt and, and pain that people have and grief they have. 
about having been dominated for most of their life while they were on earth. This is not what God intended at all. What God intended is much more pure than that. What God intends is that two people, the two halves of the soul, have a strong, passionate desire, firstly, to come to God. As they come to God, they will eventually have more and more of the same feelings, and they'll start embracing their personality. And their personality, because they're two halves of the soul, will be very, very similar and become even more similar as they progress towards God. These two people, these two halves of the soul, will eventually become one person mm-hmm. in, in all in all manners, like in the way that they think, the way they, f- they think, they feel, and the way they express themselves will be very, very similar to each other because their personality, they are half of the personal mm-hmm. personality of the complete soul. And so what God intended was that these two halves will come together by progressing towards God and progressing towards each other. But there is no sense of I- inequality between them as they progress towards God. In fact, Instead of inequality, there is this deep sense of longing for each other and a longing for an equal relationship with each other. And this is the pure condition. And so this means that the woman would not dominate the man Mm -hmm. and the man would not dominate the woman. It means the man would not control her and tell her what to do and the woman would not manipulate the man into getting what she wants through manipulation it means that they would have a very open and honest and pure relationship together and they would fully disclose absolutely everything between each other. Now, if you look at the average relationship on the planet and the average relationship within the church, this does not happen. The reason why it does not happen is because men have been taught that they are superior or that at least they have more responsibility to do and determine what happens. To preside. To preside. Mm -hmm. And to really oversee the Mm -hmm. the family. And the reality is that um, this comes from an injury-based perspective of being able to tell somebody what to do Mm -hmm. rather than engage their heart in what what they do. So in my relationship with Mary, for example, I don't tell Mary ever what to do, as Mary knows, and Mary never tells me what to do, right? There's been times in the past where, where she's tried, right? And, of course, we've had to go through the correction of all of these things together. Eventually, we've come to the point where we don't tell each other what to do. We allow each other to do anything we wish. Mm-hmm. And anything includes, you know, doing things that would sometimes stress out many people in a relationship. However, if I want to become more harmonious with God and with love and with ethics and morality... I will automatically restrict behaviour that is out of harmony with that morality. And so I would not be engaging other relationships, for example, while I'm coming closer and closer to this partner. I would not be trying to dominate the partner because that would be out of harmony with love. I would not be trying to be weaker than the partner because that would also be out of harmony with love. I'm not trying to be made secure by the partner because that would also be out of harmony with love. If you examine everything, you can see that there's so much that would be out of harmony of love if I had this equal relationship. Any religion on the planet, and there are a wide variety of religions on the planet at the moment who, prom- who, who um, desire male domination, any religion on the planet that desires domination of any gender is automatically out of harmony with love and therefore automatically out of harmony with God. And therefore, it's not really a religion in the sense of man worshipping God. It's a, it's a religion of man worshipping other men. Mm-hmm. In other words, man establishing some rules that they want to have and then forcing, enforcing that particular rule upon a group of people. And that is way out of harmony with love to engage in those kind of things. So, so any religion who has these particular problems, and there are many on the planet who have these particular problems in, inherent in their belief structure, they need to examine their belief structure far more carefully because it's certainly out of harmony with love. It's certainly also out of harmony with their relationship with their own mate, their own soulmate. Mm-hmm. Because in the end, you will be one soul, which means you don't look down upon or control the other half of yourself because you don't even feel the need to control anything. You don't feel the need to, Im- to manipulate anything. You don't feel the need to dominate anything because it's a loving relationship. And love 
determines that none of these other things occur. And that's where I feel most religions have failed with regard to this concept. If you look at most Christian religions, and of course the Mormon religion, uh, this particular principle came from Christian religion, it came from really the Jewish faith in the long run, and these kind of faiths all promote male domination to the expense of the female, which then means the female is being controlled and unfortunately oftentimes used and, and this obviously is going to result in huge amounts of pain for those particular women to actually work their way through. And in addition, it's going to result in pain for the male because he's never going to have a close relationship mm -hmm. with his wife or his partner. He's never going to have a close relationship with his soulmate because she's always feeling dominated by him and pushed around by him. And of course, there is going to be some level of resentment for that mm -hmm. particular action. Or she has to feel like she has to go in the side door always. Exactly. And I see that even when I was studying in Jerusalem that the women, the the um, Muslim women would talk about how like, they just learned how to go through things in a different way. And so you're taught as a woman to manipulate things and that totally. that's the way of a woman and that, that yeah. too is way dysfunctional. It is very dysfunctional. It, it, women are being taught by these problems. That women are being taught that the only way that they can get what they need is by manipulation, control, mm -hmm. sexual manipulation, and mm -hmm. all sorts of other things. And this is very damaging for their soul, actually, Definitely. because it, it causes them to also get out of harmony with ethics. So if you think of your own relationship, Car Caroline, um, you can see that there are things you withhold from your man um, for this underlying reason. And, uh, and as a result of the with, withhold, you know, withholding things, Obviously, there is never going to be the potential of having a very, very mm -hmm. close relationship. The only way a close relationship is really possible is for both halves of the soul to be completely open, completely truthful, and to volunteer truth rather than uh, you know, give truth when it's demanded, uh -huh. which is a big problem in many relationships, that mm -hmm. you know, truth is not volunteered. It's only given when it's demanded by the other person or pressured by the other person. And all of these particular dysfunctional relationships result from unhealthy teachings. Mm -hmm. And some of those teachings are just teachings of the environment, but many of these teachings have been perpetrated by religions and, and are still in the environment even after the environment has left the religion and oftentimes the, the teaching remains. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you see this happening all the time throughout humanity's history. And what we need to do is learn how to become more loving with each other, which means that each of the genders, both the male and the female, need to learn how to become more loving with each other. The male has to let go of his desire for dominance. Mm -hmm. He has to let go of his desire for control. The woman has to let go of her desire for manipulation, has to let go of her fears of safety. Mm -hmm. And these particular things, as they do that, they will become closer, not further apart. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. All right, the second law is called an uh, Aaronic Priesthood Law, and it's called the Law of Obedience. Uh, does God have a Law of Obedience, and how would that work? Um, well, you could say that God does have a Law of Obedience in the sense that um, everything in the universe, the way God has made it, is that any time we act out of harmony with love, then there is a consequence that appears to our own soul and the souls of others that is the result of our actions that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. So you could say from that particular principle, which is what you sow, you will reap mm -hmm. principle, that there is a law of obedience in the sense that if you obey the laws of love, mm -hmm. then of course um, things are going to go very well for you. Mm -hmm. And if you disobey the laws of love, then things are not going to go as well for you. And the results on the planet, if you see, look at the results on the planet, we have a very painful planet at the moment for the majority of people on a daily basis. And this is an indication of how much out of harmony with love we are acting on a daily basis. And this is a great feedback system. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it the law of obedience so much, though, because obedience implies punishment if you disobey. Mm -hmm. Whereas God's intentions are not to punish us but rather to correct us. So God, if you look at the word disciple even, it's about becoming disciplined. And discipline is all about correction. It's not about punishment. So, so what we need to do is we need to start embracing this goal of becoming disciplined with the way in which we do things. Now, 
It might sound quite controlled, but the reality is if we let go in our heart of all the negative emotions that cause us to act out of harmony of love, then we are automatically going to be loving everything with everything we do. And therefore it's going to be very easy to be obedient to the law of love. Mm-hmm. And, but, and God doesn't punish us when we get out of harmony of the law because the, the law itself has an automatic consequence. Exactly. Through, through disobedience of the law. So, so let's uh, examine some of the basic laws, like the law of gravity. Most of us accept the law of gravity. We don't even accept it. We, we don't think it's an unloving law. In fact, the law of gravity prevents us from flying off this planet uh, you know, at, at over 1,000 miles per hour or 1,600 kilometres per hour out in the space. And obviously, if we didn't have gravity, this particular law, then none of us would remain on the earth for any longer than a few seconds uh, before we're dead uh, because we no longer have an atmosphere to breathe. So this particular law is a loving law and we don't consider that it's unloving. But then when we go up the top of a building 10 storeys up and we consider jumping off, now we're considering breaking the law. And if we jump off without some other law to help us, like the law of aerodynamics where we jump off and Mm -hmm. we've got a parachute or some kind of flying machine then of course we're going to hit the ground pretty hard because the law states that it will continue to accelerate. We will continue to accelerate at 9.8 metres per second on this particular planet. And, and, uh, and as we accelerate, you know, obviously we're going to hit the ground at some speed and mm-hmm. potentially die from the experience. Now, we don't look at our death from, the, from disobeying the law as God being punishing or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It is just a consequence of mm-hmm. the law being broken. All of God's laws operate in a similar manner. So whenever we break a particular law, and particularly the laws of love, there will always be a consequence that occurs upon our soul. And God's not uh, individually there meeting out the consequence, you know, like going, oh, this person deserved more than that person or anything. That's all he'd be doing 24 hours a day, is exactly. punishing people. <laughs> exactly, and God's much cleverer than that because yeah. all of God's laws are created where he, he doesn't have to do anything, right? They are automatically, they just operate mm-hmm. and they automatically have consequence. They operate, consequence, operate, consequence, and the consequence is the same, identical, for any identical situation. And that applies to the soul as well as every other part of our being, a spiritual body and a physical body. So if we bear that in mind, then you can see this law of obedience is a bit more you know, complicated than just obeying a law and then getting punished if you don't obey mm-hmm. the law. Rather, it's a, the law, all the laws, the highest laws are about love, and all of the laws all have love in them. And if we disobey them, if we choose to, or we mistakenly disobey them, it doesn't really matter. There's obviously a different consequence for different laws as to whether we choose or, or, mm-hmm. or mistakenly do it. There will be a consequence, and the consequence is automatic. We can't avoid it. And, but it's not a punishment. It's not God going, you bad girl, you mm-hmm. should not have done that but rather it's just a consequence of our desire to break a law. So I do agree that there is a law of obedience, particularly with regard to love, and always about love, but there is not a punishment system that God invokes mm-hmm. once we disobey. Okay. Mm-hmm. This actually brings me to another point I was going to bring up later, but so when you formally, we believe in ordinances when you formally promise to keep a law with mm-hmm. your own free agency, does that change or amplify the operation of the law? Well, this brings us to the whole point of making vows to God. Uh-huh. Now, now, God is, God is uh, wise enough to know that uh, many of our particular vows that we make to God have to be changed in the future because we were mistakenly vowing something that you know, might have been unloving when we did it. And this is what we need to consider, is that why would God, who already has everything that we already have, require a vow from us to give more to it. God is not some megalomaniac, power-hungry being. God has given us free will and therefore given us the free will to choose what we like. Now, now God loves when, God, when we choose to love God. And the reason why God loves that is because God doesn't demand our love. Mm-hmm. And therefore, for that reason, God doesn't always get our love. Mm-hmm. All right? And when we willingly give it, God is overjoyed, as you are when somebody willingly gives you love without you even mm-hmm. you know, demanding it, it or asking for it. And this is how God operates with all of us. 
if we remember that, that God is not demanding, not controlling, not manipulative, but rather just waiting for our love if we wish to give it. And when we give it, God is overjoyed, just like a person on earth would be overjoyed when they receive love. Then we under, we'll understand better God's original desire for us. Once we understand that, then we don't see God as anything to do with punishing us or pushing us around or requiring things or demanding things. And therefore, we would have no necessity of saying a vow. Mm -hmm. In the first century, I just said, let your yes mean yes and let your no mean no. Mm -hmm. Now, if your yes didn't mean yes, then change it so that your yes does mean yes. And if your no didn't mean no then change it so it does. And there are times when you will make a mistake with that particular principle in the sense that you will say yes to something that you possibly should have, if you were being ethical, said no to. Uh -huh. And if you find that's the case, then you need to change your vow or your action. But there is no vow in perpetuity. And what I mean by that is that you can't make a promise today right, that you forever keep when you're automatically changing every day. Because you may get to a point in the future where you've changed so much that that particular promise means nothing anymore. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Mm -hmm. And so um, our making promises to God is a lot uh, on the earth, is often driven by fear. Fear of the individual. Mm -hmm. Fear of God. Yeah. Fear that if they don't do that, that God will somehow look down upon them or, or such forth. Also, fear about whether they have the ability to, to, to keep their word Mm -hmm. if they haven't made a promise. So in other words, I make a promise to God because that's the highest promise I can make. Mm -hmm. And I make that promise because in, in the end, inside of me I have this emotion that maybe I'm not good enough to do my, what, what, what I say, to keep the promise, yeah. unless I feel like God's going to threaten me in some way uh -huh. in the future if I don't keep that promise. I and this that. is often the underlying emotion driving vows or driving us making promises to God, in, I eternal promises to God. Mm -hmm. um, my feelings are, don't make promises to anyone, just live love. Mm -hmm. That's all God wishes for us. And God has a way that we can become more loving. And uh, it would be great if we at some point, you know, engage that process. But, but don't make promises that you can't keep. And to be frank, almost every promise you could make on earth, you're not going to be able to keep. I think sometimes um, at the heart of what goes on in the temple is that, let's say, for the first law, you make that a promise and you believe it's to God to keep that law. Mm -hmm. And then even if you in your heart know that that's not a law of God, you still have a hard time giving it up, giving it up because you feel like, does that mean God's, I'm, does he see that as giving up on something I promised to God or I thought? Mm. This is why if we make promises... Um, we are putting ourselves in a, in this psychological position where mm -hmm. we're, we're much more resistive to accepting mm -hmm. a truth now. So if we make a promise that eventually turns out to be something based on an untruth, then we start worrying too much about this particular problem because uh, like when you think about it, if we've made a promise that's order, out of harmony with truth, then surely the first thing God would want us to do is recognise that it's out of harmony with truth and change it immediately. That's true. God wouldn't want us to hold on to the promise because we promised it to God, even though it was out of harmony with love or truth. <coughs> That's helpful. <coughs> All right. Um, the next law that we covenant to keep is the law of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Mormons define this law of sacrifice as having a broken heart and a contrite spirit, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to do with giving up our will to God and surrendering in a way mm. to his um, His purposes for us yes and 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 with with regard to this law again there are certain positive parts to it and then there are certain very negative parts to it that we need to examine the positive parts are that yes and um, there is this underlying principle of love of divine love that when we have a contrite heart and we see the things that we've done wrong and we take this to god and we we, we talk to god about this and we obviously would grieve in that particular process we'd have a lot of personal sorrow mm -hmm. that we'd work through. That's called repentance. And repent, there is, repentance is one of the most powerful laws that affect the human soul in the universe. Mm -hmm. Because if a person doesn't engage repentance, then they're consigned to the law of attraction, what you, uh, sorry, the law of compensation, what you sow, you reap, mm -hmm. you must reap. 
and are consigned to that law until they engage repentance. And so the, the law of repentance has the same effect over the law of compensation as the law of aerodynamics has mm-hmm. over the law of gravity, in that mm-hmm. it has a higher operation and therefore can much more rapidly assist us in terms of our progression. In, in the case of law of gravity and aerodynamics, in our physical progression, progression in the case of repentance and, and the law of compensation, in our soul-based progression, which is the most, you know, the most deep progression we can ever make. That, bearing that in mind, that does not involve sacrifice. And in fact, this is one of the terrible, mm-hmm. uh, I feel, feel, false, feel, false beliefs that have mm-hmm. perp- been perpetrated on the planet, is that God requires our sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It's not logical for a start. If God was all-powerful, then God already could have our life whenever he or she wants. So why require sacrifice from somebody? Why give somebody free will and then require that they serve you all the time? Surely only a power-hungry being would do such a thing. And God's not a power-hungry being. God's all-powerful, but not power-hungry in the mm-hmm. sense not willing to share that power. So, so, so God wishes for us to see that sacrifice is a construction of our own belief systems. And this whole idea of sacrifice is driven by some quite dark emotional conditions, actually. One of the emotions that drive this whole concept of sacrifice is that, is that I don't feel that I can be perfect. And so what I'm going to do now is barter with God. I'll give God some of what I of my life mm-hmm. and he will then approve of me uh-huh. because I don't feel perfect and I don't feel I'm able to become perfect myself. Also, this concept of sacrifice is all a lot about um, somebody else sacrificing for us as well. And, mm-hmm. and this, of course, was something that was perpetrated a long time before I arrived in the first century where there was this concept in the Jewish faith that I grew up with, for example, that you could... Uh, sacrifice an animal for the sins mm-hmm. of of the man, and these principles, while they might sound all quite ritualistic, uh, and and many people believe them to be beautiful, they are totally in error mm-hmm. and totally out of harmony with love as well. The truth is that nobody can ever sacrifice enough to pay for their own sin. Mm-hmm. The truth is that every piece of harm that we commit to another person is, has long-term effects on that particular individual. And there is really no sacrifice that could ever come, overcome those long-term effects, except only one, and that is the law of repentance, the, the arrival at this point of having a contrite heart. And the law of conversation will work upon our soul as to the reasons why we committed Mm -hmm. harmful deeds and harmful actions towards others. And eventually it will refine us so the reason why we did it is no longer present in our soul. However, it doesn't rub out the fact that we did it. Uh But the reason why we did it no longer exists and therefore we have no emotional feelings anymore about why we did it. But because we've gone through the feeling, the feelings that we need to go through to remove from ourselves the reasons. So, so what I, what I'm saying there is that there are certain parts of this particular law that are in, in the Mormon faith that are certainly true. So the law, the law of repentance, for example, or what true repentance really mm-hmm. is. They don't understand what true repentance mm-hmm. really is mm-hmm. uh, at, at the core level. Uh, because it's much deeper mm-hmm. and has much deeper requirements than the law itself of, in the Mormon faith states. However, the law of repentance is a very important law to understand from God's perspective. But sacrifice, there is no such law. There is no law of sacrifice. There is no law demanding where God demands of us a, a sacrifice because God never demands of us a sacrifice. God, de- God desires that we embrace our will in a positive direction and that we finish up loving God Mm -hmm. and and loving our fellow man because we personally desire it. That's what God desires. I think a lot of Mormons would say God desires for us to give our will to him. No. Why give a person free will and then ask for them to give the will back? Mm -hmm. Logically, it does not make any sense to give a person free will and then say to that person, if you and I are going to have a relationship... I want your will back. You know? Now, you know, a, a God who loves, and any person who loves, doesn't give a gift 
mm. only to want the gift back. You imagine if you gave your children the gift on Christmas Day, right? And then you said to everyone Christmas night, all right, all those gifts are mine now because I bought them. Or if you love me, you'll give me the gift back. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that means then that you never gave the gift in the first mm -hmm. place, doesn't it? And God's not an Indian giver, as the saying goes. In the sense, and I don't know why it's ever termed that way, because a lot of Indians give a lot better than a lot of people in the West. But, but a lot of uh, uh, you know what we think God is is not what God is. God does not give us something only to demand something in return. All of God's gifts are given willingly, and forever, and with no desire that we give anything in return. No demand that we give anything in return. Of course, God loves it when we decide to love God, mm -hmm. but, but that's not abdicating our will. In fact, God views our will as one of the most important gifts God's ever given us. And for that reason, God wants us to learn how to use our will mm -hmm. in harmony with the laws of love. Mm -hmm. That's all God really desires from us in the long run. He, but again, it's not a demand. God's not saying, you have to give this back to have a relationship with me. God's always desiring a relationship with every individual on the planet, whether they have one with him or not. In fact, God knows every person who's ever lived, and God knows everything about every person that's ever lived. So from God's perspective, the relationship is already established. Mm -hmm. It's just whether we are going to actively engage that relationship or not. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, the fourth law we covenant to is called the law of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And it is defined as the, the gospel that you taught in the first century. Mm -hmm. um, this law is actually only referenced once in our scriptures. And so people kind of don't really know what this is about, except for that they're agreeing to it. Yeah. Do you have any insight in, into maybe a translation of what that could mean to the spirits who are maybe influencing the temples? Sure. This was a, an attempt by those spirits to amalgamate my teachings with the new teachings that they were giving to Joseph Smith through channeling or uh -huh. through mediumship. And so what they tried to do, and, and they tried to do this with many of their teachings, they tried to amalgamate the principles and t things that I taught, and then the things that I, I did not teach, they that they have taught, they say there's new revelations mm -hmm. that they've been added to that and given those new revelations to Joseph Smith. Um, this is a bit of a, a distortion of reality, though, from their perspective, because the reality is many of the things that they newly revealed to Joseph Smith I never taught, and many of the things that are contained within the gospel I actually never taught either. So, mm -hmm. so the problem uh, is that they uh, struggle with what was actually taught in terms of the first century. What was actually taught in the first century was very simple, really. Mm -hmm. It was all about this relationship with God that I keep mentioning all the time. And developing in humility and truth to such an extent that we can enter this relationship, receive divine love from God to the point of transforming our soul into a place of atonement with God. Mm -hmm. That was the gospel that I came, the, the God of love mm -hmm. was the God I came to expose. And the God that I have attempted to expose from that time till now. And... Um, so I feel what they're referring to with this particular law is, is, is the, basically the, the gospel that I taught in the first century, which was really a gospel of a loving God mm -hmm. helping us to become more loving people. And, uh, and I feel that is the biggest principle that needs to be embraced in any, in any faith, that we have a loving God and that God can help us through receiving this love from God. We can actually be transformed into become, becoming more loving people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we do, in our own religion, have this idea of a Heavenly Father who loves us. Um, and we do have a have an idea about a Heavenly Mother, although we're not allowed to talk about her. Yep. Um, <laughs> we do. We're the only religion on the earth that it recognizes that she exists, but... Yep. believes that she's completely silent in all ways. Of course, because she is submitting to the domination of the man. <laughs> We're not going to go there in this interview. But. Okay, the fifth law we covenant to is to only engage in sexual practices with our spouse to whom we are lawfully married to. Mm -hmm. Can you explain maybe how this is a law of God or how this works? Well, there are underlying moral principles that are included in this law which are true. Mm -hmm. And then there, um, the, but there are issues and problems if we start to believe that any relationship we personally establish on earth is a permanent one. Mm -hmm. 
So, so we have some positive aspects of this and some negative aspects of this. If I start with the negatives, the negative aspect is if we cannot obtain a divorce at some point in the future from this particular one partner that we've had, then, um, then there is a chance that we've made a choice to be with somebody who is not our soulmate. Mm -hmm. In other words, the other half of ourselves that God has designed to be with us. And at some point in the future, when we recognize, oh, this person is not their soulmate, but that person actually is, and I know for certain that person is, I have no mechanism to actually change my life or grow. And so this is a limitation that is being placed on us. However, there is a moral principle that's involved with this law that are very true. Mm -hmm. And that is that in the long run, we will never engage sexually with any other person other than our soulmate. Mm -hmm. And if we have multiple relationships, and particularly multiple relationships going on at the same time, then we are being quite unethical and immoral with all of the people involved. And there will be disastrous consequences physically, spiritually and emotionally mm -hmm. upon our soul if we engage this behaviour regularly and, uh, and without any feelings of repentance, without any feelings of sorrow about it. The reason why is God created our soul very sensitive to the relationship with our other half, our soul mate. As a result of that, any time we sexually engage with another individual who is not our soul mate, there will be a feeling in our soul that, that is painful, created, because we're actually disengaging mm -hmm. from the other half of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, it's not something that God's punishing us about, but it's an automatic consequence of breaking the law that binds the soul together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so this principle comes from that particular law, the principle true. of being sexually engaged only with, a, with one partner, mm -hmm is a very good principle to engage in your life. If you don't know whether the person's your soulmate or not, well, that, that's one issue that needs to be addressed in the long run of your life and will be addressed either here on earth or in the spirit world at some point in your future. But if you have one partner and engage many other partners sexually, you are actually going to cre be creating a lot of pain for mm -hmm. your own soul in the future to have to address. And a lot of pain for the and the soul of the others who you are engaging in that manner mm -hmm. as well, whether you are engaging them consensually or not, because it will be out of harmony with the law of that governs the unification of the soul, and and anything that's out of harmony with one of God's laws automatically creates pain in our own soul that we'll have to experience at some point in the future. So there are many people who engage relationships after relationship sexually or even have multiple relationships at the same time sexually and then they meet that one special person who they do believe is soul, their soulmate and then when they recollect all of these experiences of their past they do have quite a lot of grief mm -hmm. to work their way through because seeing the damage that they've done through these things and the memories that they've created mm -hmm. um, which also cre cre carry their own baggage um, and and so this law protects you from those that kind of damage mm -hmm. to a large degree, um, so so but in the long run, we will never have eyes for anyone other than our mate, our soul mate, and and if the person that we are married to is not that person, then at some point in the future that relationship mm -hmm. will will disband, and that's what I mentioned in the first century a lot too. I was asked many questions about. Which wife, because many men in the first century had many wives, they, they would often ask the question, which wife will I be with then in the, in the spirit world? And I said to them, you may not be with any of them, in fact, because maybe none of them were your mate and, mm -hmm. and were the mate that God has created that is the other half of your soul. And sooner or later you'll find out that when you arrive in the spirit world. Um, this next question actually was motivated by spirits. Um, speaking of the sealing itself, mm -hmm. what counsel would you give to spirits in the spirit world who believe that they have made a binding covenant to God to be married or sealed for eternity while on earth but have now realized their eternal companion is not their soulmate? Yes. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of pain in that, yeah. Because they feel there, there is still the feeling in many of these spirits that they may be uh, somehow punished for the fact that mm -hmm. they are now breaking a vow that they gave. Mm -hmm. What we need to understand is that God knows where we are at any point in time. God knows when we're making a vow that we're going to have to break at some point in the future because we haven't recognized a certain one of God's truths. 
God is not hung up about the breaking of vows that God already knows will have to be broken at mm -hmm. some point. And, and this is very important for us to understand. Even, and this is why I said with, about the vow situation, even if we make a vow or we seal something or we bind something on earth, it may have to be unbound mm -hmm. in heaven, as I've said before, and actually is contained within the scriptures in the Bible. And, and this is one thing we need to come to understand, is that just because we decide something, mm -hmm. it does not mean it's real unless it's actually real. Mm -hmm. And so I can decide that, ah, oh, you know, such and such is my partner, and then I work through a lot of different things in my life and even pass into the spirit world, and then I realize she's not my soulmate. I've actually got this connection with this other person over here that I never even met on earth, and she's my actual soulmate, or he's my soulmate. Then, then obviously, from God's perspective, God wants us to be with our mate, mm -hmm. not with the person that we vowed ourselves to be. And God knew at the time we made the vow that it was already out of harmony with one of God's laws. And therefore, what God wants is to bring ourselves into harmony with mm -hmm. those laws, rather than remain out of harmony. We don't need to feel the feelings of guilt about making such vows. What we need to do is look at the underlying emotional reason why we made such a vow mm -hmm. and believed it to be true. Okay. Because there are often emotional reasons of self-determination, you know, don't, not being reliant on God and also not wanting to change, not wanting to make mistakes. All mm -hmm. sorts of reasons Definitely. cause us to make vows that we, know, we can't keep mm -hmm. and will never, from God's perspective, never be able to keep in the long run. I can see that it's so easy to just be hung up on the, the guilt and the bad feelings instead of say, why did this happen? Exactly. What's underneath this that what, I need to address? What belief in me about God did I have? Uh -huh. Because that, that is the primary thing that controls this. Oftentimes we have beliefs that God are going, is going to punish us if we now break this vow. Mm -hmm. And this is not a good understanding about God. This is a, a, an understanding we have about a wrathful God that doesn't exist. And God is far more loving than any of us on the planet and in the spirit world even can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And and for that reason, we need to understand that any time we make vows, we are often being driven by an emotion of potential punishment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are being driven by a false belief in God that okay. we need to look at seriously as to why we have that belief. Okay, mm -hmm. great. The last law we covenant to is to consecrate all of our time, talents, and um, means to the Church of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. of Latter-day Saints for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth. Yes. And I have some questions from spirits who have already passed that wonder why they would have to do this to a church that won't exist eternally and to a church that's on earth. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the fact is that they don't have to. Um, Again, this is another perpetration of the spirits who are involved in the creation of the religion. Okay. It's a great way to rapidly establish a religion, not only as a religious force, but also quite a strongly financial force. And this allows for potential growth on the earth mm -hmm. very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Any gift that is demanded is no longer a gift. Mm -hmm. So God does not demand that we ever give God a gift because... If it, there, there was a demand, it would no longer be a gift. And the same applies with anything we give on the earth. Now, of course, if we firmly believe in something, then it's highly likely that is where we will invest our time and our effort and our resources. Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if a person firmly believes in all of the teachings of a religion, such mm -hmm. as the Mormon religion, then it would make sense if that person was sincere that they would devote their time yeah. and their resources and their energy to that particular thing. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to feel bad that we had sincerity in our devotion. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't have to later on go, oh, now that I've left that religious faith or I realise that certain things are not right with a certain religious faith, that now I feel bad about having given my mm -hmm. time and resources and energy. There is no need to feel bad about devoting your time, resources and energy in a loving manner, like not because you were wanted something in return, mm -hmm. but because you were willing to give it wholeheartedly because you firmly believed it at the time. Of course, there are certain emotions that cause us to firmly believe these things at the time mm -hmm. that we need to address, but that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. And what I'm talking about is the sincerity that exists mm -hmm. in the person. So 
whether we're on earth or we're in the spirit world and we've been devoting our energy and resources and money and, and financial resources and time to anything that's on the planet and then we realize sincerely and we're doing it out of sincerity we're not doing it because we want something mm -hmm, from it right mm -hmm. so that's a different issue altogether but we're doing it out of complete sincerity of heart then when we realise that we we probably shouldn't support that particular faith or religion or whatever in the same manner unless that particular faith or religion changes its viewpoint of love, then we don't need to feel guilty about what we've done in the past because it's actually done out of sincerity mm -hmm. of heart. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this is something that we need to bear in mind, that, that anything that's done out of sincerity of heart always has its own reward. Mm -hmm. um, even if it was misguided at the mm -hmm. time, it does have its own, own rewards. Now, if we do something out of sincerity and heart that does damage another individual, that mm -hmm. is a different thing. Okay. So, in other words, if I'm in the, I'm a Spanish inquisitor in the, you know, in the 15th century or 16th century, and I'm, I'm there torturing people to death out of sincerity of heart, <laughs> then obviously um, we, we have problem. some major problems mm -hmm. uh, okay. if we think we can engage in, in unloving, violent behaviour towards another individual and still be sincere, because the reality is we can't. Okay. And we need to bear that in mind in all of these comments. Yeah. So, um, so the law of tithing, um, even to get to the temple, we have to um, pay 10% of our income yes. in order to go there. Yes. Um, so are you saying that, that and in order to do, we believe that, that that happens because if we do that, then we won't be burned when you come again. Exactly. So again, it's a fear of punishment. And remember I said earlier, anything that involves fear can be discarded as a teaching. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we need to understand the reason why such tithing was engaged by many religions, not mm -hmm. just your own. And that is, uh, and, and it was engaged in the Jewish faith, of course, as well. There was this, t the, the, there was this idea of tithing that was present there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where gifts were given to the temple. It all was driven by spirits and people on earth who wanted power and prestige in actually serving God. So therefore it was driven by an underlying poor motive. We do not need physical temples on the earth to worship God. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. We do not need any location, in fact, to worship God because worship of God comes from our heart. And mm -hmm. therefore wherever we are, where our heart is overburdened with our, you know, and, and expressing its love for God, then we are in a state of worship right in that moment. Mm -hmm. And God acknowledges and honours that as much as whether we're sitting in a temple or a church or home or sitting home with the children or, you know, making love to our wife or hu husband or whatever we are doing in that moment, there is this connection with God that occurs that is pure of heart. That's worship. Mm -hmm. And all of us need to understand that's worship. And therefore, we all also need to understand why we are addicted to having places of worship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is so that we can feel something that we don't normally feel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because we just need to feel that we don't normally feel it mm -hmm. instead of trying to manufacture something that causes us to feel something um, that we don't normally feel. In other words, we're engaging in addiction with God. Okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say to God, you need our physical, you know, worship mm -hmm. and you need our physical creations mm -hmm. to demonstrate to you that we honor you mm -hmm. now from god's perspective the way to honor god is to use your free will in a loving way that's the best way you can ever honor god okay. to use your free will in a loving way love of yourself love of others love of god use your free will in that direction in those moments no matter where you are from God's perspective, he has a relationship with you. Okay. And you do not need a religion. You do not need a place of worship. Although places of worship can encourage those mm -hmm. particular feelings if they are properly engaged with love. So, so the demand, though, that is made upon a person to financially give a certain amount is now no longer a gift coming from mm -hmm. the heart, but rather a demand with a potential punishment. And of course, whenever there is the threatening of God punishing you, then everybody goes into tremendous amounts of fear because that's the worst kind of punishment mm -hmm. you could ever receive. The reality is God never punishes you. The laws, when you break them, all have their immediate consequence. And what God desires from us is our heartfelt feelings of wanting to become more loving. 
that's all God desires of us. That being said, there is no harm in giving financially to an institution that you believe in. Mm-hmm. Because giving can might, might assist that institution to distribute love and, uh, dis- and distribute truth in particular, mm-hmm. which, it, which will help people become more loving. And, and so giving is a beautiful thing that you give another group. So you might find a, an organisation that's religious that really does connect to your heart and helps you connect to God and also helps you be, become more loving. And of course, you'll probably want to support that organisation with your heart and also with your resources and your time. There'll be other organisations that do just as well in other areas that support your heart. So you might find an environmental Mm organisation that does exactly the same thing. Or you might find your favourite food made by a certain person and that engages your heart and so you want to give to them financially. And in the end, uh, giving of financial gifts or or any other gifts, our time and our energy, is all a beautiful way that we can express Mm -hmm. our love for, for other people. So I, so I wouldn't say don't give anything and don't and certainly if you firmly believe in your religious faith mm-hmm. then why would you not be giving something from your heart mm-hmm. you know but if you feel like it's being demanded of you mm-hmm. or you feel the threat of punishment in the giving then it's no longer a sincere mm-hmm. gift anyway and therefore it will, will not have a reward or are you doing it out of obligation or just because you've always done it and so you just write the check every month or it comes automatically drafted out of your account every month. And exactly. You're not really growing in love anyway because no. it's just a... Because you're not engaging your heart in the process of giving. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, from God's perspective, what God wishes for us to do is to engage our heart in the process of loving others. Mm-hmm. Now, part of loving others is giving them our resources and, mm-hmm. and you know, the time, the energy, the money, the, the, the physical things that we have and that we create are, are, is all a part of our sharing with other people. Mm-hmm. But when, it, when we feel an obligation associated with it, then we're not really sharing anyway. We're, we're yeah. not giving from our heart, and, and therefore we're automatically out of harmony with the law of love. Now, if we go back to, what was it, the third law about obedience, mm-hmm. um, we're automatically out of harmony with the law of love, and therefore it can't have a positive consequence. Mm-hmm. Sooner or later it's going to have a negative consequence when we're out of harmony with okay. that law. Great. This is the last question about temples. Um, Mormons engage in prayer circles in the temple? Uh, engage in? Prayer circles. Ah, yes, yes. This is when one person in the middle prays and then the other ones are around them and they link arms and they recite what the person in the middle is praying about. Yep. Um, there are certain apocryphal writings which speak of prayer circles also being performed in the first century. Yep. So, first of all, were prayer circles occurring in the first century? No. Okay. Are prayer circles a more powerful or effective way of praying to God? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I explain you. why? Sure. And um, the problem with many so-called prayer circles is this. When I pray, that is my personal feelings directed towards God. Not, not even thoughts or words necessarily, mm-hmm. but feelings. Mm-hmm. They're my feelings specifically for God. When I pray in front of you, what are we now engaging? Some addictions. Obviously, there has to be some addictions involved. In the first century, I said it would be better for a man to go into his private room and pray alone Mm -hmm. than it would be for him to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why it's better to pray alone is because you can feel all of your true feelings for God in that moment. But when you're with a group of other people, you are now potentially engaging in addictions with these other people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Which then engages this process with God that is out of harmony with sincerity. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't hear those kind of prayers. Now, if all of the people present all engaged their own longing desire towards God and all prayed individually, maybe silently, because it would be pretty Mm -hmm. noisy if it wasn't Mm -hmm. silent, um, with God, this process, then, of course, the entire group of people would be greatly benefited by Mm -hmm. that prayer. That's the kind of prayers that are usually engaged in the spirit world. That's the kind of prayers, group prayers, that I suggested people had on earth in the first century. When you and I and every other person present has the same longing mm-hmm. that is sincere coming mm-hmm. from our heart directed towards God, that has a powerful effect mm-hmm. because God feels very strongly our desire and intention 
And God, of course, always wishes to give us what we desire or intend as long as it's in harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to have a very powerful effect. Prayer itself has a very powerful effect. However, prayer engaged in groups often has many addictions associated with it. Mm -hmm. And also there's an attempt to force people in the group to have the same feelings that Mm -hmm. you have. And this is not very positive for their particular progression. They need to engage their heart, not yours. Mm -hmm. Now, while your words may be inspirational and therefore help them to engage their heart, so that would be a positive thing, Having a prayer circle where everybody, you know, tries to interpret or feel what the person's feeling is almost pointless because it's prayer is about God and you, not mm-hmm. about anybody else. Mm-hmm. When I say about anybody else, I mean you may be praying about somebody else, but it's about your feelings about that person mm-hmm. and God, not anybody else's feelings. Mm-hmm. And, a, and another person can't fake or manufacture those feelings. Mm-hmm. They have to have them in reality for it to actually be a prayer. Okay. So, so I would encourage people who are engaged in prayer circles, and, and there are many New Age groups that are mm-hmm. engaged in prayer circles, many Christian groups and many Muslim groups and so forth engaged in prayer circles, to consider the reason why they do not feel that they can pray in their inner room, as I said in the first century. Why can't they pray to God and feel satisfied with that personal relationship with God mm-hmm. and that God will answer that particular prayer? Now, I'm not saying that it's unwise to have public prayer, because the reality is you can have public prayer. If every single person in a, present in a place all desired the same thing, then that's an automatic prayer to God. And if that prayer was in harmony with love, then God will definitely answer it positively. So that, that, that is a state of public prayer. Somebody could outspokenly even say the words of what they feel in public, and that's fine too, but they need to address the motive. So when we get together and do prayer circles, we need to particularly look at our motivations. If our motivations are so that we can all feel more holy and all feel more acceptable and all feel like we have a connection with God when by ourselves we do not feel we have one, then there is obviously addictions in place and God does not respond to addictions, ever. Great. Mm. Well, I want to thank you for doing this interview. Um, The last question I had had to do with really Mormon spirits and perhaps we could do some mediumship about that but um, I just want to thank you I feel like there's a lot of things that you've resolved that have been um, been holding or constraining a lot of spirits on earth and a lot of people here who sincerely want more truth and sincerely want this relationship with God and yes. I feel like yes. this rela- this conversation has really healed a lot of that yeah, that pain. Yeah. yeah, it's been wonderful that you've been able to engage this. It's, what I find is wonderful is somebody who has a personal knowledge and emotional connection with their particular faith, mm-hmm. asking questions in a forthright, straightforward manner is very powerful because it not only helps truth be known on the planet, mm-hmm. but it also helps all of these spirit, spirits who have passed, people who have passed into the spirit world, who are locked up by their belief systems not able to progress further towards God because they they are so afraid of giving up belief systems Mm -hmm. that they can see may not be harmonious with love and truth, Mm -hmm. but they're so afraid of the promises they made to God and and it becomes very, very complex emotionally for many of them. And I feel it's very important to state the truth for for their sake as well so that they are then freed up and, and allowed to progress. Hopefully, um, in some point in the future, myself and Mary will get to channel uh, some of these spirits in public and therefore help some, of the, some more people understand what's gone on mm-hmm. for them. Because many of the founders of the Mormon faith, for example, are in the spirit world and they ha- are working through their particular reasons why they uh, perpetrated the belief systems initially with Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith himself is doing a similar thing. And, and, and this is the same for many other faiths and religions on the planet too. So the more that we can engage these kind of truths and also engage the spirits who are involved in delivering these particular religions to the planet, the more we can heal every mm-hmm. person involved, not just the people on earth who are practicing a religious faith uh, but not feeling certain about its practice, mm-hmm. Or, but also the people that are in the spirit world who, who have a large and strong desire, many of them a sincere desire to connect to God, but feel quite a lot of fear in the process. So it's been great that we yeah. can engage this. And I know you've had to make a lot of personal choices and decisions, Caroline, to 
um, to to decide to do it, mm-hmm. and uh, and I I feel that if you can work through any fears you have, then there will always be a positive benefit to mm-hmm. everybody involved, and I feel that there will be a great positive benefit to the Mormon faith and other faiths as well, because many of the things we've discussed mm-hmm. actually do relate to most of the religious mm-hmm. faiths on the planet as well. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to our videographers, uh, Michael sitting on one of the videos there. If maybe, Mary, you could just show Michael for Igor's sake. It's a little bit hard for the um, lights. Oh, the lights there. Um, if we just turn that light off. Um, can you just pull out the plug for that light so we just turn it off? Yeah, so there's Michael up there. <laughs> and there's Mary behind the other video there. And then we've got a, a couple of people in our audience. If you just pan over to those people, uh, say hello. <laughs> Um, and it's just before we begin a, um, a seminar this afternoon. So, yeah. Thanks, Caroline. Okay, thank That's you. very, very good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And, uh, and I enjoyed uh, all of those questions. That okay. good. And, uh, and it's also very good because all of those questions pertain to basic fundamental truths, don't they? It's like, mm-hmm. so good. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it's going to be a very interesting interview for... For, lots for lots of people, not just people of the Mormon faith, but lots of other people. And, and I know you don't think there's going to be many views, but potentially there'll be a million views of this particular. Well, I, I think in the future every single Mormon will eventually view this video. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Well researched as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.